This is a Renegade Media Network podcast. Let me tell you guys about a sponsor of this show, and that is Zipix Toothpicks. They are wonderful flavored toothpicks that have nicotine in each one. You can find them at zipixtoothpicks.com. A lot of you are probably trying to kick a bad habit here in the new year. These are a great alternative to that habit. And it's really, it's, come on, let's face it. They're sponsoring this show, so you know that's a good thing. But I'm telling you, they're the cheapest alternative on the market. They've got flavors. Let me tell you, right here, I've got my packet. Zipix Toothpicks, Spearmint Spice. I love this flavor. They've got whiskey flavor. They've got clove flavor. They want to sponsor shows like mine. So that should make you want to give them some business. They've got a promo code, a new one, a new one with the Counterflow podcast, the promo code is BUCK, B-U-C-K, of course. So go to Zipix Toothpicks. That promo code, BUCK, will get you 10% off of your order. Once again, ZipixToothpicks.com, promo code BUCK for 10% off your order. They're delicious. They got just the right amount of nicotine in them, and you will enjoy them. Kick that nasty habit, and let's get to the show. You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in fucking half, but I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash your sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, guys? Welcome back once again to the Counterflow Podcast. Yes, you heard it in the intro. I am Buck Johnson, your host and humble narrator. So this is going to be an episode that I want you to be able to pass around to people that might not normally listen to a show like this. And that's because the guest is so good at what she does. And what she does is, well, maybe... It's not even specifically what she does on a routine basis, but part of what she does in this episode is reach out to someone who is trapped in the cult, the religious cult of social justice warriorism, we can call it, the uh, social justice cult. And she was in it for 20 years. Can you believe that? And think about you know, 20 years ago, we are kind of overwhelmed with the craziness of it at this point. She did this for 20 years and she finally was able to break away from this cult. And now it's kind of like once you're on the outside looking in of a situation that you were neck deep in, eyeballs deep in, you realize how insane and evil it really was, right? So that's that's what this episode is going to be. It's uh, Carrie Smith. She is, well, I'm going to give you her intro here in a minute, but she's so good at describing what this social justice mentality, the cult, the uh, tenets of it. She's so very good at describing all of that stuff. And you probably know a lot of people that are in this. There, hopefully you don't, but I certainly do. And you can see the damage it does on their psyche. And it's, uh, it's sad. And a lot of the times you just have to kind of cut these people out of your life because you feel maybe they're a, a lost cause. But not all of them are. And my guest, Carrie Smith, is living proof of that. What a, what a great chat this is going to be. Well, I, you're going to think it is. I already know it is. Carrie is really cool. This was wonderful to chat with her. I'll give you her intro now so you can kind of get the details of, of who she is and where she's come from. And I think you're going to love this chat. She is founder of Civility Dinners and the co-founder and co-host of the Deprogrammed and Daily Cove Feffy podcasts at Unsafe Space. A self-described former SJW, that would be social justice warrior, Carrie Smith is best known for her work in addressing her old belief system through writing and lectures. Her essays on leaving her former ideology have been shared by Jordan Peterson, Stephen Hicks, and Sargon of Akkad, and praised by Joe Rogan. Her writing has been featured at Fee.org and The Dissenters Project, a collection of essays on the price of dissent in our current culture. I rebranded this podcast here as the counterflow to get people that speak 
truth counter to the establishment narrative. And Carrie Smith certainly does that. Welcome to the show, Carrie Smith. Thank you for being here. How are you? I'm good. Thank you, Buck, for having me. I'm so excited to meet you, someone else in Texas. I know. I started researching you and I kind of thought, how have I not run across her before, even in entertainment circles, because we're going to get to that. But I come from the music world in Austin, Texas Mm -hmm. um, for 20 years. I, you know, now because of what's gone on, I've moved out of Austin, Texas, and I've not played since February 2020. Wow. But yeah, let's let's actually get to some of that because for those listening that aren't familiar with your story, kind of talk about what you do and where you come from. And of course, we're going to get to the long journey that you've had. Sure. But I'm telling them about the podcast, what you do and all of that kind of thing. Sure. So I am co-host of a podcast called Unsafe Space. And we do a couple of different shows. We do a live show Mondays and Fridays called Kafefi Break. It was just just kind of us talking about current events and whatever people in chat want to talk about. But we also do a show called Deprogrammed, which is more of a deep dive into social justice ideology, So, which is my old belief system. I was in that belief system for about 20 years. And so we talk a lot about that. And we do long form interviews with people um, for that show. And then we also do just standalone interviews with interesting people. I mean, we really, Unsafe Space is just, about trying to foster a community that believes in the principles of free speech and civil disagreement. And we also host a book club, which is one of my favorite things that we do. So every month we read a different book, we alternate between fiction and nonfiction. And then we have live discussions with people in the community who want to be a part of it. So that's, I would say right now, like right now we're reading Cynical Theories by Helen Pluckrose and James Lindsay, which is nonfiction. And last month we read uh, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress, which is an old sci-fi novel, like a dystopian sci-fi novel by Robert Heinlein. So we do like a real range of different of books. And so that's a lot of fun. Was the current environment we're all a part of not dystopian enough for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny is reading a lot of these dystopian classics now, because I know a lot of people read them in school. Mm-hmm. That's been a long time for some of us. And so when we first started book club, we started with some of the, you know, the classics that everyone or most people read in school. We started with 1984, Brave New World, Fahrenheit 451, Animal Farm. Mm -hmm. And reading those books now is so enlightening because it helps people make sense of what they are seeing, what's going on around them. Look, here's a great example. Animal Farm, you know, they've got this this, um, mantra that you know, once they take over the farm and then slowly the pigs start to take over and they start changing the rules to suit themselves and they start taking more than the sheep and the other animals are getting. They start taking more of the milk and honey and, and apples and um, they start violating their own rules and, and changing the rules to suit themselves. And, and what did we see during the lockdowns of this mm-hmm. past year? We've seen a lot of politicians who've pushed for lockdowns uh, violate their own orders. We saw the mayor in Chicago say she was going to throw you in jail. She said this on camera, throw you in jail if you violated lockdown. And then, you know, they found out she violated it and went to get a fancy haircut. And what did she say? She said, well, I have to get a haircut. I'm the face of Chicago. That's like the pigs in Animal Farm. They, right. they were like, some animals, it started off with all animals are equal, and then it became some animals are more equal than others. That's just politics. Like, it's Steve Adler. That's yes. his name, right? The, yep. ma- the mayor of Austin. Yeah. He was in Cabo. He violated, he told everyone before Thanksgiving, you know, don't go out, don't go out for Thanksgiving, don't see your family. And then what did he do? He took a private plane to Cabo with family. <laughs> and that's some animals are more equal than others. So yes. I think the beauty of reading those books now is that it really helps you to distill down like what you're seeing into um into its its essence like the real hypocrisy you can identify it more easily i think so. where did you grow up everyone you know this is for my audience that's not in texas or not from austin every time you meet someone in austin you go where are you from because there's always this uh, assumption that well no one actually grew up in austin yeah i'm from south carolina originally but i came here uh, like a lot of people, I came here via California. I lived in Los Angeles for about 15 years after college. 
and I moved out to Austin about four years ago now. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, I'm slowly getting further and further north, like further away mm-hmm. from Austin. <laughs> Yes, I'm, but sort of like you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> away from it too. Now I'm. Uh, it's, uh, we're we're going to get into some of that, but it's. Yeah, I'm almost embarrassed at this point to say, "Oh, I'm from Austin." You know, so I don't have to anymore. Is that where you're from originally? No, I. But I moved there in '98. Okay. So, you know, as far as you know, there's always this joke in Austin. Well, if you've been here over ten years or something, then you're basically an Austinite. And so I definitely saw. It was amazing when I first lived there for years. It was really a cool spot. There was just the right amount of kind of hippie type stuff mixed with Mm -hmm. outlaws and bikers and cowboys. And it was a neat music community. And then slowly, a lot of this stuff just, I don't know, maybe I grew out of it. It kind of, it turns me off a lot of that stuff now. No, I think it's progressively gotten more woke because I'm like you. I used to visit Austin for work um, several times a year. I would come out. I worked in entertainment. Mm -hmm. So I would come out for comedy and music festivals. And um, and then I also had some good uh, girlfriends in Austin from college and and my science and math high school. And so I used to come out like four or five times a year. And I really felt like it was a just a really special place. Like you said, a good mix of people and perspectives and culture. And now it's not just you. It's not that you've grown out of it. It's gotten a lot more woke. It reminds me a lot more of Los Angeles. And Mm. it's also gotten more corporate, which happens at the same time. You'll notice all of Congress Avenue. I mean, just in the four years I've lived here in the area, Congress has changed so much. They were raising the rent on on small businesses there, um, sometimes uh, 10 times within, within a year, you know, a lot of those mom and pop shops have closed down like, uh, oh gosh, what was the name? Turquoise door, you know, yeah. with the bullet. Yeah. Um, I think Creatures, the dress shop did. And, and and they were basically, the the owners were like, well, if you can't pay this new rent, you know, Starbucks can. Yeah. We're going to put in a Tiffany's across the street. Right, <laughs> like, right. Like and think Beverly about Hills. this, when I think back next to the Continental Club on South Congress, maybe the first five years I lived here was a gun store. And it was called, I believe, Just Guns. What? Could you imagine that now? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. They would be boycotting. Their windows yeah. would be broken. Yeah. So let's talk about your entertainment background. For those who aren't familiar with what you did, get into that because that does have to do with kind of the social justice stuff that yeah. happened in your life as well. Yeah, so I was a a comedy manager and producer. So I managed comedians. I worked at a couple different companies before I started my own with my my business partner. And our company was called Whitesmith. We're a very small boutique company. It was just the two of us and some a couple of assistants and interns. And we managed. I, I managed comedians. She managed musicians. So and then and then I was based in LA. She was based in New York. And uh, with my comics, you know, I also got to do things like we pitched television shows. I got to uh, produce a late night show called Totally Biased with W. Kamal Bell, who was one of my clients. And several of my other clients uh, wrote for that late night show. Um, we pitched and developed uh, concert, comedy concert films, uh, books, um, albums, uh, comedy albums. So it was a lot of different things that we were involved in. And I tended to work, not exclusively, but for the most part, I worked with comedians who shared my social justice belief system. So I was, at the time, social justice ideology was not mainstream like it's become now. It wasn't culturally dominant. And so I I was kind of, I felt like I was doing, I felt like I was doing good work because I believed, I was a true believer in the belief system um, I believe that social justice, it sells itself as being this, you know, this ideology that's that's opposed to racism and sexism and and it's about equality and and ending oppression. And I believed all of that stuff. I got into it through the feminist door. There's a lot of different doors that will take you to it. Hmm. Critical race theory is one of them, queer theory is one of them, fat studies is one of them. Um, you know, mental health justice is now one of them environmental justice. There's all kinds of the justice, right? But uh, I, I got into it through the the women's studies door at college. Um, I went to Duke University 
over 20 years ago now. And that's when I was first introduced to a lot of these ideas. And so when I went, when I, when I went into the, the working world, like a lot of people my age who were indoctrinated with this system of belief at school, I took it with me into my field of work. So uh, uh, I, I was actively trying to push my belief system through the projects that I worked on, the comedians that I managed, the ideas that I was helping to put out into the world. And a lot of my friends did that, whether they went into the media um, or they went to work at places like Google, um, Instagram, like social media companies, mm-hmm. uh, or, or if they, some of them went back into academia to teach and to indoctrinate more people, mm-hmm. you know? Um, but, but really it, it is, once you get pulled into this belief system and you become a true believer, it becomes the primary motivating force in your life. It's like a religion in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. And so your goal is to push it in whatever it is you're doing. And it becomes, if you get enough people in your organization, whatever your organization is, if it's a company or a church or a hobby group or you know a nonprofit group, if you get enough people that believe in this, this social justice kind of Marxism, then it sort of cannibalizes the group. It, it's, a, it's like a parasite. It's parasitic. Mm-hmm. It takes over and it becomes the primary focus. Mm-hmm. And it becomes more important than even, like look at some of the companies that are pushing it since it went mainstream this past year. You, you see everyone from McDonald's to Amazon to you big entertainment studios that are pushing it, um, comic books that are pushing it, and they're losing money, yes. a lot of them but they're still doing it. They're still pushing it. You used a lot of terminology there and then even referenced it, that it is like a religion and and just Mm -hmm. the indoctrination and some of the words that you used. I always refer to it as that, but I I think maybe I almost do it in a cavalier manner, but you break, I've heard you many times now break it down so well. Yeah. Why is it like a religion? Why do you make that comparison and explain to the average person that's kind of, eh, they hear it's a religion, but what does that mean? Explain that. Yeah, well, it serves the function, for a lot of people, it serves the function of a religion. It gives them a sense of meaning and purpose, and it gives them a system of morality. It tells them this is a, this is a system of morality. They feel like good people when they push it. And it also, it borrows a lot from Christianity, some things from Christianity. So for example, they don't, they have something, well, everybody's heard this now because it's gone mainstream, Privilege. Your privilege in this belief system functions a lot like the concept of original sin. And you're supposed to confess your privilege. But it's different from the concept of original sin in that they believe people have varying degrees of this sin or privilege based on what race and sex and sexuality they are. (laughs) So you you know, if you're a straight white man, you're going to have more of this kind of original scent, more of this privilege. You're born with more of this privilege than I am. So you have a lot more to atone for. And there's also, they don't really have a concept of grace. There, you, you are constantly atoning and um, having to make a show of your virtue. Mm-hmm. And one of the ways in which, you know, I say it functions like a religion, but it's actually, you know, it's, it's like a culty religion because yes. if you go down the cult characteristics and you try and see which ones apply. Most of them do, with the exception of there's not one charismatic leader that people can point to, like a Jim Jones or a David Koresh. There's not this like one guy like Charlie Manson or whoever who's leading it. So that I think throws people off from being able to identify it appropriately as a cult because they're like, well, it doesn't, you know, fit this this idea of of what I have of a you know, what a cult looks like, but look at all the other characteristics, like cumulatively, it checks off a lot of them. It, it tells you to, that you should basically isolate yourself from people who don't believe. Mm -hmm. Um, They cut off contact with people. If you, if you leave the cult, like I did, you're treated as a heretic. They treat you the same way Scientologists treat people who leave Mm -hmm. the same way that, that the Nexium cult treated people who left. They don't just let you leave easily. You know, you have to be publicly shamed and called all these names and, and they will cut contact with you and unfriend you. And people lose family members. They lose friends when they leave wokeness, when they leave social justice, um, 
So it, so in that way, it's like a cult. It's also like a cult in that it discourages questions Mm -hmm. and conversation and dialogue. You're not supposed to ask questions. You're not supposed to notice any of the contradictions or even just the act of trying to have a conversation. They've set up all these things within the belief system to make you, to discourage you from even doing that. So they get you to censor yourself Mm -hmm. so that you don't get mobbed and piled on by your fellow believers. (laughs) They get you to self-censor. And then if that doesn't work, if you, if you are the kind of person who, really insist on understanding better and wanting to have some things cleared up for you. If you vocalize those questions, oh my gosh, you know, that's evidence of your privilege. Um, You are engaging in oppression just by asking these questions. They have like all manner of things that they'll say about you when you start to question things. So do you think, how do I phrase this? Is there something mentally with some of the, I mean, you could always pick that with any movement, but it almost seems like there's a darkness to some of that mentality. Did you witness now that you're out of it? Do you look back and go, okay, I can see some of the deeper issues that are going on with a lot of these people? Yes, absolutely. And that it may put some people off to hear me say this, but I often, I often call it evil, this belief system. I do believe it's evil because Mm. it's not just that it's a collectivist and and racist and sexist belief system. It's that it takes well-intentioned people and it turns them into mouthpieces for the very things they think they're opposing. Yes. And I think when you're living in that kind of unconscious way and you're living in that dishonest way, part of you deep down knows it. Even if the cult tactics are working and keeping you from actively questioning and have gotten you to shut off your brain for the most part, you deep down, you know it. And so a a lot of people in it um, struggle with mental health issues. And here's a a weird, here's a weird part part of it because I I should back up. So, So I often compare it to Marxism. And so a good way of thinking about it is like, you know, Marxism, classical Marxism that we, that we learn about or hopefully learn about in school. A lot of us don't. That's why this is a problem. Yeah. But Marxism says the best way to look at the world is as a struggle for, uh, for wealth among class groups. Well, this belief system says, no, it's a struggle for power between identity groups. But the tactics are the same. They believe in redistributing power among groups instead of redistributing wealth. They talk about oppressors versus the oppressed. It's, it's, it's kind of a mutated form of Marxism. And so because it's based around identity and power and within the ideology, you get almost a kind of social credit, mm-hmm. the more of these oppressed groups you can check off. So they say everything. You need to look at the entire world as this struggle between identity groups or power. And so everything gets put into a category of oppressed or oppressor. And if you can, can check off more of the oppressed groups, you get a greater voice in the ideology. So because of that, there's all these new identities evolving. And so you get, like, for example, I, I mentioned fat studies. Fat studies is now a part of it where they say um, you are the oppressed if you're fat and you're the oppressor if you're not. Mm-hmm. And so fat becomes this marginalized, oppressed identity that you can claim to have more credit in the belief system. And same thing with mental health. This is what I was working up to is they now say, if you have mental health issues, you're oppressed and you're marginalized. And, and so therefore, the, the messed up thing about that is it encourages you to stay in any kind of mental health issues you have instead of working on it because it tells you that's your identity. That's who you are. Mm -hmm. You see on Twitter, people put it in their bios. They're like, I am um, black, trans, queer, fat, bipolar disorder, BPD, anxiety, and depression. You know, it's like, what? Yeah. That's not who you are though. That's not who you are. And you're going to stay there because you think it is, Mm -hmm. you know? So I think, I think it encourages people to stay in, in unhealthy behaviors. And I know I'm talking quite a bit, but you also, there's something you said about the darkness. It This belief system thrives on resentment. And it, it took me a long time to see that, but it, 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 it thrives on this sort of uh, entitled, resentful, you know, bit of human nature that if left unexamined can, can eat you up and make you just a really unhappy, negative force in the world. 
and and it tells you those things are okay. Can you imagine? Instead of saying, you know, you need to let go of some of that resentment and learn how to handle it and learn how to like the antidote to that would be gratitude, right? Right. It actively discourages you from feeling gratitude or joy. Um, if you if you are in this cult, if you're deep in it and you post things on social media like an expression of joy, like something good that's happened to you in your life or something you want to celebrate with friends. Yes. You can you can find yourself at the end of a social justice mob where they're like, this is the inappropriate time. Did yep. you know that XYZ happened today? How dare yep. you? This is your privilege that allows you to feel this joy. Yes. <laughs> like, what? I've actually <laughs> seen people proud about losing weight and saying, I'm, I've lost some weight, but then they have to back it with, but I realize that not everyone is in my mindset and people think big is beautiful. And so you're getting to where normal people can't even just celebrate, hey, I lost weight and I feel healthier. No, you can't. I've seen that so many times. And they'll get angry. I've seen them get angry at fellow feminists in the movement if if, if a woman in the movement posts about, about that, about, about any goals that she set for mm-hmm. getting physically fit. And if she shares an update of so many times, they've been piled on like that's, how dare you? This is triggering. I don't want to say anything about your weight loss. You're normalizing yes. you know, weight loss. You're normalizing working out and kind of, you know, stuff like that. They it's, love that word, normalizing. Yeah. Talk about <laughs> how you used to feel when you were in this, when you would walk into a room. I've heard you go on about that. I think that's an interesting detail. Yeah. So like I said, it's it's a system of belief. It's a whole, it's an entire, like, it's an entire ideology and it tells you that you know you you the the world is this competition for power between these identity groups and so you need to find the hidden racism and sexism in everything that everything is racist and sexist or fat phobic or transphobic and all that is all the isms they're always there and so i've the way i've talked about in the past is it's a bit like putting on glasses every day where you're just putting on these glasses and you're looking at the world through these lenses and you're trying to find the racism and sexism. And it really, it really kind of, this is why you see this constant outrage culture that we're in because so many people are wearing these glasses. Now Mm -hmm. they're constantly looking to be offended and it makes them feel righteous to be offended. You know, I'm one of the righteous oppressed, or if they're in the, in one of the oppressor groups, the so-called oppressor groups, then they get to feel, uh, they get to virtue signal and yes. they get to shed some of their privilege and apologize for some of their privilege and confess some of their privilege by being one of the good white people who sees the racism everywhere, right? Yes. And who calls out other people and for being racist, like that it gives them a sense of, of a very cheap sense of virtue. Yes. Um, but it also, I think it's unhealthy to go back to the mental health thing. It's unhealthy because when I was in it, like I would, I would walk into an entertainment, for example, I always had this assumption that I was going to be treated differently because I was a woman. And sometimes uh, I think I was, but other times I think I was just reading into it and looking for it. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I was going in with this attitude and you kind of invite, I don't know, there's, I don't know if I believe in the law of attraction necessarily, but I think sometimes you can, you can create the very situation that you fear the most. You think about like a really possessive girlfriend, for example, who's always just uh, over the top, like uh, uh, possessive and paranoid and thinks that you're cheating all the time. And then, you know, that kind of person can maybe drive you to eventually leave her or to cheat because it's just so oppressive. It's like that kind of. And so in that situation, I'm giving that example. It's like that person fears being left and being left alone and abandoned and yeah. being cheated on and being lied to. And they actually cause it to come into fruition because they're so over the top about it. I think that's that that happens sometimes with people in social justice is they walk into a room looking to be treated differently because of race or sex or sexuality. And they're just setting themselves up to, to have like negative interactions. They believe that there's going to be a power imbalance. And so they act out their part of that, you know? Yeah. It's weird. I want to tell you guys about one of my favorite sponsors, and that is Lucky Guy Bakery over at luckyguybakery.com. You already know this because you've heard me talk about them before. They make the world's greatest brownies with flavors like, well, my personal favorite, the Oatmeal Jackson, which is made with white chocolate and cranberries. They've got the peanut butter bonanza bar. Of course, they've got the iconic brownie with 
dark chocolate slabs. And think about this. Speaking of that, Valentine's Day is coming up. What a perfect way to surprise and impress your lady or your man. Get them some of these wonderful brownies. You know they're going to pair well with a good wine. And what will that lead to? Well, you can thank me later. And one way that I am going to help you out with this, I've got a promo code for you. That is B-U-C-K, Buck. When you enter that promo code, after you're done shopping at luckyguybakery.com, you will get 20% off of your order. How cool is that? They've got gift boxes over there. You can order the four pack, the six pack. You can customize your gift box and each one of them comes with a personalized note made by the people over at Lucky Guy Bakery. So I've got you all set up for Valentine's Day, guys. Thank me later. LuckyGuyBakery.com. Promo code B-U-C-K gets you 20% off of your order. Let's get back to the show. Maybe this is because I was in Austin and let's face it, the demographics in Austin aren't particularly diverse as much as some would like to pretend that they are. But I, I did see often, I would kind of see people in this movement and I thought, there sure are a lot of white women in this. Oh, I yeah. Mean, is, in your experience, is that kind of the prevailing demographic? I made a joke about this on trigonometry where they asked like, what do you think it was about you that made you susceptible to this belief system? And I <laughs> joked, well, I'm a woman. <laughs> but it's only a half joke because I do believe women are women are a little more susceptible to it because women on average, I hope everyone understands averages. Yes. <laughs> women on average uh, self-report that they're more interested in working with people than with things, right? Mm-hmm. Women, on average, on the big five personality, they, they, they score higher. We score higher in neuroticism and in agreeableness. That's not true for every woman. That's how averages work. There are women who don't, that doesn't fit for them. It does fit for me. I think I score I score pretty high on neuroticism and agreeableness. <laughs> um, but those things make you, especially the agreeableness part, it, it, uh, it sort of, it appeals to women's desire to be interested in people to protect people, to stand up for people who are being um, mistreated because it tells you, it says this is, this is a belief system about ending racism and sexism and about standing up for the oppressed. And so it appeals to people who want to protect like the underdog. Um, Jordan Peterson has talked about this before and he's sort of was just, I think he, he was kind of thinking out loud, but he was saying maybe there's something there with women with the innate biological drive to protect their young and to protect children that kind of a kind of can get taken and pushed sideways into this, something like this. It can, it can manifest in an ideology like this where um, that is sort of being tapped into in a way to get women to get involved and to go and protect. They think they're protecting the oppressed people. What actually ends up happening is that you get a lot of white women in it who and you get a lot of elite people. That's another thing. Yes. This is a this is like a luxury belief system because, yes. you know, I learned it at Duke University. People learn this at uh, very elite institutions in academia, and it's only in the past ten to fifteen years that it's trickled down into public schools. It's in public schools now. I didn't I didn't learn it in elementary school. Thank goodness I did not learn it in high school. Um, but now kids are learning it as young as kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to change things a little bit, but the people who are my age, who've been pushing it, a lot of them, they learned it in college. And, uh, and so you get a lot of these elite, actually, I would say privileged people who, who latch onto this. Um, some of that I think probably comes from like, look at some of the look at some of the people who are famous in the ideology. Peggy McIntosh, she's a white woman who coined the phrase "white privilege" mm-hmm. back in the '80s. She wrote an essay called "Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack," and yeah. Peggy McIntosh was very wealthy. She was, I think, in the one percent of people <laughs> in terms of wealth. She lived a very privileged life, and. I think there's something about people who come from that kind of privilege wanting to share maybe any guilt that they have over that kind of of privileged life with an entire race of people or with an entire uh, sex of people. Then you feel like you're sharing this thing with others like um, Morgan Spurlock, for example, I've mentioned him before. 
you saw a version of this during Me Too when he he uh, he kind of did his confession about women he had he had behaved inappropriately with sexually, and he confessed to all these different things he had done. And then at the end of his confession, instead of taking personal responsibility for this, he decided to make it all about all men. It's like, we men this, we men do this, we men need to do this, we men, we men, we men. Like, no, no, no. <laughs> I know that's very comforting yeah. to suddenly share the blame for yeah. your personal behavior, but I think that's why it's appealing to people. It's, it's uh, They can transfer whatever personal guilt or shame or responsibility they have and like, share it collectively yeah. with you with a whole group of people. You mentioned it's an elementary school that I, it triggered a memory here. I was just hanging out with a friend and she's a nanny. I believe she was having kind of a play date with another nanny, but whatever the case was, there was a child involved. It's about four. And so she saw some of the books at this other house with the nanny and, and for the four-year-old. And there was now one for that age group written by Ibram X. Kendi. I know which one you're talking about. Is it anti-racist baby? Something like that. Yeah. And she said she was like horrified. And she's like, I'm trying to snap a picture. Like, oh my God, I can't believe this is real. And for a four-year-old. Let me tell you what's, I, you have to laugh at stuff like that because it's so yeah. over the top. But at the same time, it's like, there's a balance of laughing, but also taking it seriously. Ibram X. Kendi uh, is one of, I call them the high priests and priestesses of, of the movement. I, I took that from my friend, uh, Gracie West, who's another former social justice warrior. But there is no one charismatic leader, but there's several of them and they change over time because they're usually, usually they'll engage in backbiting and pull down whoever's popular mm-hmm. for too long and then mm-hmm. someone else will rise. Mm-hmm. Um, but currently Robin DeAngelo is a white woman who coined the, the phrase white fragility. Robin DeAngelo and Ibram X. Kendi are two of the high priests or shamans in this belief system at the moment. Ibram X. Kendi wrote Anti-Racist Baby, which is one of the most disgusting racist books and, and forms of indoctrination I've ever seen directed towards children. And not only is he celebrated and lauded for it, he just got $10 million from Jack Dorsey at Twitter. Mm-hmm. Twitter just gave him $10 million to spread his racism that he calls anti-racism, by the way. They're really great at branding. Right. Hey, it's, but you call, it's called anti-racism. I guess it's good, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. uh, Antifa, yeah. you're against he, fascism, uh, right? Yeah, you well, it's all in the name. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard someone say, like, I guess these people only shop at Best Buy because they think it has the best buys. Like, they're really, like, <laughs> right. they just fall for the... Yeah. For the branding. Sounds good. But yeah, anti-racism, Ibram X. Kendi has said that it is impossible to be not racist. He offers this false dichotomy. He says, you're either racist or you're anti-racist with me, over here with me, Mm anti-racist. Well, what's anti-racist? Oh, it looks a lot like racism. It involves judging and treating people differently on the basis of race. Mm -hmm. But it's okay because we call it anti-racism. No, no, you're just offering people two different kinds of racism. You're not give. you're saying that it's impossible to be anything else. That's not true. He is, what he's doing morally, I think is just as evil as, as what someone like David Duke would be doing, a white supremacist would be doing. The difference is in the degree to which it is validated yes. and lauded and supported and propped up by the mainstream. Can you imagine Twitter giving David Duke $10 million to spread his racism, but they'll give it to Ibram X. Kendi. It's just as atrocious. Yeah. And, and, and then anti-racist baby, this is the most recent news about him. Netflix just signed a huge deal with Ibram X. Kendi for three different programs, three or four, uh, to develop three different uh, series or films. And one of them is anti-racist baby. Mm. Wait, can you imagine Netflix doing a deal like that with David Duke? Like, no, no and the, never. And, the irony, and rightly so. Well, right. But the irony is they still hold up David Duke like he's somehow relevant. And you'll I hear his name from yeah. time to time. Oh, that guy said something about, nice about David Duke. It's like David Duke has zero power. Exactly. Zero. He cannot be on any platform. I'm sure he can't bank with anyone. He's probably just got gold and cash somewhere. But the guy's <laughs> an idiot who's irrelevant. Yeah. Yet on the re- opposite side of this, like you said, just as bad, these people control just about every institution, every form, outlet of power in media, certainly these days. 
And I also found it ironic that the last four years they were called the resist movement. And it's like, yeah. what could you possibly resist? You own everything. It's it's the resistance brought to you by McDonald's. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. Brought brought to you by Procter and Gamble. Yeah. And the revolution will be sponsored. Amazon. Right. Yes. That's There's, right. I want to ask you about leftism versus maybe social justice warrior ideology. Do you differentiate between the two? Because I I kind of, and maybe mistakenly so we can get into this, I always refer to leftism as a little bit of a religion as well. And I don't mean kind of the old school people who who you might even categorize Tulsi Gabbard in that way, like who are genuinely anti-war, who are genuinely free speech, but believe in, I don't know, government owning certain means of production. I kind of mean the modern left. Yeah. I look at that as a religion, and I also look at it as a supremacist movement in that it doesn't seem like they want to stop until they run everything, and everyone who's a bad person is silenced and gone because you would hear, well, we have to have gay marriage. Well, gay marriage is the law of the land now, and conservatives kind of went, eh, okay. And then it's like, and now we have to have trans bathroom. There's never just a, okay, I feel good about kind of we've we fought this good fight. Let's kind of get along. It's always moves, moves, moves. The goalpost yes. constantly moves. Let's remove a statue from this square. Oh, it's gone. Is that all? No, no. Now you've got to have these other, it just keeps going and going. Do you see that as well? Yeah, I do. And uh, that's a good point you're bringing up because a lot of word, it's really, I think, becoming very necessary for us to define terms because we're living in such chaotic times where words are losing their meaning or they're being misused or people are using, they just have multiple meanings now. So Mm -hmm. a word like leftism, I have at times used it just very generally and broadly to describe anyone on the left politically. Um, And then other times I've used it specifically to refer to social justice people. Mm -hmm. And now I'm considering just not using it very much because people have people on the left who are not social justice, who are, I consider actual progressives. Right have pointed out to me that, you know, they consider themselves a leftist, but not social justice. So I don't Mm -hmm. know, lately I've been thinking, I'm just going to try and stop using that particular word for a while until I figure out what I mean when I use it and and, and instead of using it in different ways. So uh, I'm not answering this question very well, but, but, but what you're asking is, yes, the left, see on the left, this, this whole, the social justice ideology has kind of merged with a lot of the neoliberal yes. um, uh, career politicians, the elite part of the Democratic Party, the people who are fine with war, like the pro-war yes. Yes. part of the party, the pro-corporation part of the party, and that seems like a weird marriage for some. But it's I don't I don't really think it is. I think it's just that the elite politicians or the neoliberals they're gonna they're paying lip service to whatever right. pop whatever they see is popular. And and this is what has taken over and become culturally dominant on the left is basically cannibalizing the whole left. And and at times it sells itself as progressivism. It's not. It sells itself as liberalism. It's not. It's decidedly illiberal. Social justice people believe in censorship. We can yes. see what's that's running rampant at the yes. moment. They believe in censorship. That's not liberal in the, in the slightest. They believe in violence. They believe in the initiation of force, which... Yep is the opposite of what Martin Luther King taught about. I mean, they're the, they're opposed to classical liberalism. They're opposed to individualism. They're collectivists. And so I'm starting to hear from more uh, progressives, like actual progressives who are anti-war, who are anti-racism and who can see this for what it is. They're starting to wake up and liberals, classical liberals. And one silver lining of these, we get, we've been going through these periods of acceleration yeah. and we're in one right now. And during these these ramping up, uh, you know, of the of the belief system during these periods, I think a silver lining is that more people are able to see it for what it is. That's when I woke up. I woke up in 2016, 2017. It was a long process, but I noticed this ramping up happening after Trump was elected, and I couldn't understand it. And I also couldn't understand why he won. I was trying to figure that out. <laughs> so, but that's that whole time period. That was a period of acceleration of this belief system. And that's when I woke up. Well, now I'm seeing the same thing four years later, like just in the past week, Buck, I've Mm -hmm. had several people contact me. I've talked to people online. I've sat down and talked to people in person. 
people who are seeing all the censorship happening, they're seeing all the propaganda, and they're starting to, I think, in my opinion, wake up to this this uh, illusion of right left being so important. You know, they sell us this polarization to keep us fighting all the time, like over are you right or are you left? And mm-hmm. I don't really think right and left matters very much right now. It's like, are you authoritarian yes. or are you an individualist? Right. <laughs> and if you're an authoritarian, I don't care if you're authoritarian on the right or the left. Right. Like you're an authoritarian. Mm-hmm. Like that. Goodbye. Like I'd rather talk to an individualist, whether they're conservative or liberal on the right or the left. Those are my people because you, because you believe in individualism. Right. And, and I think more people are waking up to that. You said, you kind of hinted at there that there were certain things where you were thinking, wait a second, what, what's really going on with this? So was it an incremental awakening for you getting out of this movement? Did you wake up one morning and you were like, what am I doing with this stuff? No, it's not a fast thing. No, uh, it's very incremental, incremental, like you said, and, and getting into it is incremental as well, because if, if at the very beginning when I had started taking all these classes and learning about these concepts about like, oh, white, white privilege and the new definitions of racism and sexism, they teach new definitions for a reason, by right. the way. Yeah. But I started learning these things. You learn them bit by bit. If at the beginning they had said, and, and now you're going to defend censorship and violence against people who disagree, I wouldn't have joined or I wouldn't have picked up this whole system of belief. It's, it's a slow boil. That's a good and point. then getting out of it, yeah, getting out of it is slow too, because it's like leaving any cult. There's all this stuff that's set up within it to keep you from questioning and to fear leaving it. And um, for me, there were a few things that happened. I, number one, I went down this rabbit hole on YouTube of videos from, it was videos of Trump supporters being attacked Mm-hmm. by people on the left, by people who are presumably on my side. And it was so emotionally upsetting to me and disturbing because I had been, I had believed the opposite. I was really plugged into the propaganda machine, you know, the whole legacy media machine and, and people put their faith in the media. I used to put my faith in the media and, and, and I believed without any evidence, I believed just through opinion pieces and through headlines and through this massive propaganda, I believed that Trump supporters were violent, that they were causing violence at rallies. And then when I started watching these videos online, it was like video after video of people on the left attacking Trump supporters outside of Trump rallies Mm -hmm. with bricks, with eggs, with mobs. And I had not seen any of that being reported on. Mm. And so that was huge because one, it was emotional. And I really think if you're going to wake someone up it's hard to do because you can give them all the facts in the world, but unless you appeal to their emotion, it, it's not going to have an impact. Like have the facts on your side too, but you have to figure out how to talk to their emotional mind. And that emotionally just wrecked me. And then, and then, so that was one thing. But then secondly, it made me realize, it made me question what I actually knew and understood about the world. So I had believed this one thing and then I was seeing the opposite with my own eyes. And I looked, I was looking for videos of Trump supporters attacking mm-hmm. liberals and I, and I couldn't find it. I found like one guy that kind of punched someone at a rally, but nothing like I saw the other way around. And, um, and so that shook me. And then shortly after that, I saw again, something emotional. It was the Black Lives Matter Dallas protest where a sniper killed several police officers. And mm-hmm. there were people in my self-selected social justice echo chamber online. There were friends of mine and people I knew, acquaintances who were celebrating it to a degree and seemed to be fine with murder. Mm-hmm. You know, it, they felt like the ends were just, they didn't mind the, these awful means. And that yeah. blew my mind. And, uh, and then the, I think the final thing, and this one really um, helped me was Someone had shared a video of Jordan Peterson with me and they were calling him transphobic. And I went to his video expecting to hate on him as a transphobe. And and instead I came away with a completely different opinion. He he didn't say anything transphobic to my mind. He 
he uh, was making an argument against compelled speech and yeah. being codified into law. Mm-hmm. And so I started watching more of his videos and he was one of the first people who helped me to articulate what I was going through, what I was noticing on, on my side and helped, you know, like when you first start trying to leave this cult, you're going to question if you're going crazy because you're not just changing a policy position. You're changing your whole foundational worldview. You're getting rid of those glasses that you've been wearing and putting on every day. So it's really, it's re, it can be very scary and it can be very confusing. And um, sometimes you'll, it's, it, you're like, is it just me? Am I, what's happening to me? Is this, am I really seeing this? And, and you are going to find people if you're someone who's going through this process or if you've gone through it, through it, I know you can relate, you will start to find other people who've woken up or who've started to question. And then it kind of helps because you're like, oh, I'm not alone. Like mm-hmm. this is, other people see this. So there were several things and it was a long, a long process. I Even after I felt pretty comfortable in my opinions about social justice and how I had been wrong for two decades. And in my opinion, that social justice was harmful. I still didn't talk about it or voice those opinions for about six months because I was too afraid. Mm -hmm. It took a long time. What's up, guys? I would like to tell you about a wonderful small company that reached out to me to sponsor this show because they love the content. That company is Paloma Verde CBD and Organics. It is owned by two great people, Carlos and Vanessa Abalar in my old town of San Antonio. They are libertarians. And honestly, the COVID lockdown was a bit of a blow to their brick and mortar location. But Carlos has assured me they are tough and will soldier on with business from people like my listeners. That is you guys. They will power on. I trust that for sure. Go check out their website at palomaverdestore.com where you can find things like their amazing melatonin CBD gummies if you'd like to sleep a little bit better. You can find the sports cream if you've got achy muscles. I know you guys work out constantly and they've even got CBD skin salve. Of course, they have the CBD extract tinctures for daily use. They have gummies for all occasions, including strictly vegan ones if that is your thing. You guys know the great anti-inflammatory benefits of CBD. And by the way, All of their products over at Paloma Verde are THC-free. They've even got the studies on their website to show exactly that. And so check this out. I told you they're great people. They want to support my show. Here's what they're going to do for you guys. When you use promo code BUCK, B-U-C-K, you will get 25% off of any purchase over $75. You will also get 10% off of your first purchase when you sign up for their emails. So add that up. 25% plus 10% will give you a total of 35% off of your first purchase. You want to support a small libertarian owned business and support my show at the same time and get a great product that you will love. Go to palomaverdestore.com and use promo code buck, B-U-C-K. That is palomaverdestore.com, promo code buck. And I like this product so much, guys, that stay tuned. After this episode is over, I'm going to air a quick little interview I did with Carlos and Vanessa Abelar of Paloma Verde CBD, and you will see exactly why they are so great, what their story is, why they created the company, and exactly how good their products are. So stay tuned. After this episode, that interview will air as well. Let's get back to the show. Well, you wrote a wonderful piece called Waking Up to the Cathedral on leaving a cult of belief. And this question will be twofold. Uh, First, can you detail for my listeners kind of what the idea of that piece is? And and I'll get to the second part after that. Sure. I, like I said, I've been hearing from a lot of people in the past few weeks who are wondering what's going on in the world. And some of them are waking up to what I call the cathedral, a lot of people call the cathedral, which in my mind is the the legacy media, big social, academia, major corporations, and the political elite of both parties. They're waking up to the propaganda that we're being sold, that we've been consuming, to this narrative that's being forced on our throats, This and a lot of it having to do with social justice. Um, 
And a lot of those people are liberals and progressives. And so I wrote that piece because talking with some of these people, especially like sitting down with them in person and you see how, how emotional they are and how, gosh, how much grieving they're going through. And it reminded me of what it was like for me four years ago. Mm-hmm. Cause now I'm to this point where, I mean, I'm pretty comfortable. I don't really care what people say about me and hmm. all, all that's pretty, you know, it's in the past, like, it, but it brought me back to what that felt like at the time. And I just, my heart goes out to people who like that and people I've corresponded with because I know it is a slow process. And I was trying to write in one part, I was trying to write to them and just say, it is worth it. And it does get easier. And yes, you are going to lose things. All those things that you're afraid of losing, you are going to lose a lot of those things. You are going to lose friends and maybe family, and you're going to lose some people that have known you your whole life who you thought knew your heart. And you're going to feel a lot of pain. And because some people that you, you never would have suspected of doing this. Some people are going to call you alt-right, Nazi, white supremacist, extremist. Um, People are going to question if you've gone crazy um, and sometimes at the beginning, anyway, you might be tempted to agree with them or wonder if they're right, you know, like you're going to question yourself and that's okay. And yet, and yet you're still, if you're a person who is driven by a pursuit of truth or, or by trusting your gut, you're still going to walk through all of that, even when it's hard because you feel compelled to do so. And, you know, in talking with, with some of these people, I was thinking like, like, gosh, what would I have wanted to hear when I, when it was the hardest, like, or when I was so afraid of what I was going to lose and what I would tell myself, what would I tell myself, uh, you know, uh, four years ago? And it, it, it is this, yes, you're going to lose some friends, but you're going to make better friends. And when you're in the middle of the mourning process and you're grieving what you're losing, you may not be able to see that because you haven't even, you haven't even met some of these people yet, <laughs> mm-hmm. but you're going to meet people who are open-minded and you're going to form stronger relationships with people. And you're also going to, you're going to make stronger relationships with some of the friends that you don't lose the people who stay in your life. You're going to find out who your real friends are. Um, you may lose your job. You may choose, you know, to leave it. I had to leave mine, but it's worth it. Like I make a lot less money now than I did when I worked in entertainment, but I can't think of a price tag. Mm -hmm. There's no number of Bitcoin you could give me (laughs) (laughs) that that would, that would make it worth it to go back to that way of life because you can't put a price tag on peace, having peace, liking yourself, um, you know, freedom of thought, freedom of speech. You can't put a price on that on joy. You can't put a price tag on that. And the more that you start to, live authentically and to, to be honest uh, about what you're thinking and about questions that you have and about, you know, ideas, the more free you're going to, you're going to feel and the more you're going to like yourself. And I was talking about this with my, my uh, unsafe space uh, podcast co-host today, Carter, and he was pointing out, he said, like, some of those friendships that you're mourning or that you're afraid of losing are probably already over because now that you've started to question things, you either have two options. You can be honest with those people or you can hide yourself from them. And if you're hiding yourself from them, well, you've already fundamentally changed the relationship because they're now interacting with like a false version of you. And so I I guess I was, I was trying to say like things will get Better. And there's all these things that you're going to get on the other side of that fear that you have no idea about right now, even when it's really hard and everything. So, you know, just keep going. That's what I was saying. And also, also, I was chastising. <laughs> I was chastising. There's been a few people who were never in the cult of social justice, or maybe they've always been on the right or the conservative side of things, or maybe they've always been centrist, or uh, I'm not sure, but I've seen uh, it's. Some people say in the past four years, they'll have like this sort of angry response to people who are just now waking up. And it's not a lot of people. It's it's a very small portion of people. But 
uh, I've seen it enough times that I wanted to say to those people, like, you you need to have some compassion. This isn't like, uh, yeah. you know, everybody's discovering your favorite band in high school and now you feel like you're not special anymore because they all like the same band. It's not yeah. like that, you know, you're, you're, if you believe in individualism and, and you believe in equality and you, you're against censorship and you're against uh, violence and you should be happy when people wake up to your point of view right. and you don't want to be uh, discouraging. You don't want to push grieving people who are just waking up. You don't want to push them away out of some kind of resentment or arrogance or like a, a, a feeling of maybe wanting to be special or to have been right first. You know, it's, I think it's, it comes from like a very frustrated place, that sentiment, but it's wrong because it's, it's counterproductive. And, and also if you haven't ever left a cult of belief and you've never dealt with the, the fallout of, of raising your entire system of belief to the ground and starting all over from the ground up, like you don't know what that's, you don't know what, how isolating that is for people and the, the shame that is heaped on them and all the friends that they're going to lose. You, you haven't been through that. So you don't even know what you're talking about. Like be a welcoming place for people, be a rock, Mm -hmm. be someone who helps guide them. If they're, if they're new to wait, to waking up, don't push them away. If you're throwing a party, you should be happy no matter how late people are to your party. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well put. And you should be happy they came. <laughs> I had a second part all ready for that. And you went okay. over, well, you went over it wonderfully. I was just going to say, if there are those listening that are kind of on the fence and like, I need to get out of this crazy thing, what advice would you give? But you just had a wonderful dialogue of just that. Is there any extra thing you would say that you maybe didn't touch upon there? Because I probably don't have a ton of social justice warriors that listen to this show, but I do... You know, I have a large circle of music friends, and so I, I know some of them probably secretly listen. Some of them message me sometimes. But anything else you would say to someone who's like, I think this is crazy? Well, I know there was on Twitter, there was an account that started called uh, Musicians Against Woke Wokeness or Musicians Against Woke Ideology. I think it was Musicians Against Wokeness. Ooh, and it was that. a group of musicians who were anonymous liberals and progressives who are against social justice and they recognize it as being illiberal. (laughs) And, but they were anonymous for, as, as you can imagine, for good reason, because this is, this has consumed a lot of the artistic world at the moment anyway. Yes. Um, And I think they may have gotten banned from Twitter, (laughs) but you can still find some of these different groups. Yeah. (laughs) You can still find some of the different groups uh, for, for different States because they were, they also had separate accounts for different areas. And uh, if anybody's listening in the music world and you are, are alarmed at what you see happening around you and you, and you, you have questions about social justice ideology. And I, I would, I would encourage you, well, like I was just saying, follow your gut and follow the pursuit of truth. And, and the thing about art is art is best when it's, it's pushing back against orthodoxy, I think, yes. and, and offering a space. So artists get out there, typically you artists get out there and create a space for people like, and kind of push the boundaries so everybody's a little bit more free culturally to to express themselves, and and um, when artists start to feel censored and start to feel like they have to self censor, yeah, things have gotten pretty bad. And so, uh, take a page from the artists who are rejecting woke ideology. I mean, in the comedy, I'm more familiar with the ones in the comedy world, but in the comedy world, you have people like Ricky Gervais, mm-hmm. um, Dave Chappelle, uh, John Cleese. There are comics who are saying, no way, like, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not playing this game. And that's really inspiring. And um, I'm sure there are some musicians who are, who are not woke. I'm just, none of them are coming to mind right now. A yeah. lot of them are very woke. <laughs> there are some, and I, you know, they write me and I'm, and we've been friendly and I've known a lot of them, but yeah, you'd be surprised. You'd hear some music. And then if I told you this person's woke, you'd be like, how does he make this kind of rebellious old school music? But I got to get to this too. A lot of people that listen to this podcast are, we'll call it black pilled or have a negative view of what's coming up with the next administration. You have to have some silver linings. I like to end on some optimistic notes. And you kind of just said there's people kind of waking up, but that maybe this is like it was four years ago for you. Yeah. What is some optimism we can end on? 
you know, Buck, I should have asked you at the beginning if, if I was talking to a lot of black pill people. Because, <laughs> some. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, there are some of the Carter likes to say I'm one of the white pilled people. And that doesn't mean white supremacy. It means yeah, he means I, right. I've taken the God pill or the hope pill. But uh, uh, I do. I do have hope. I mean, because if I didn't have hope, I wouldn't wake up and do our unsafe space podcast. Why would I Let's just go live in the mountains with my dog and keep it to myself and do what I want? <laughs> like um, the, the I have hope because, well, first of all, I'm a pretty recent Christian. And I know some black pill people are going to say, oh, she's just joined another cult. But hmm. I am a pretty recent believer and I do believe in a higher power. And I believe there are things that I can't understand. And and even in my personal life, there have been personal things that have nothing to do with ideology where I, I can't explain certain things or, but I've trusted in God. And then, and then I can understand a little more on the other side of that trust. Um, and I, and I think it's like that sometimes with society, like in my personal life, I had to get to the darkest place imaginable before I could see the light. I got, I got to a really dark place about five years ago. It was around the same time I started waking up. Mm -hmm. And I I think that's a whole nother conversation, but I think that had a lot to do with why I was primed to, to kind of open my mind a little bit. Mm -hmm. But, but I think that can happen to a country. I think that can happen to a community is that sometimes you have to get to a really dark place for there to be a glimmer of light. And even if you don't believe in God, just look at history humanity has been through really repressive regimes and, and they've come out on the other side. And sometimes it, it, it's kind of crazy, but in the most repressive environments, that's where, that's where people start to find like meaning and truth and find out what's important. And, you know, I've been reading a lot of Alexander Solzhenitsyn lately. Yeah. And, you know, if, if, if there's another guy, uh, a friend of mine sent me some, some Orthodox Christian books. And I was reading about some, some other people who found God in the gulag Mm -hmm. and, you know, who went in as Marxists themselves and, and came out and as atheists and came out believers. And, you know, we are not being at this point, we're not being rounded up and put on box cars and, you know, we're being put into digital gulags. We're being deleted from the public square online all wrong thinkers. Mm-hmm. Uh, our unsafe space Twitter got banned a week ago today, and we still haven't heard from Twitter why. They haven't told us why. But but that's not happening to us in, in real life. It could eventually. I don't know how far down the road, but but um, I would say uh, be grateful that this is we're not we're not there yet. And then also um look at the silver lining, look at the people around you. This is again, why I say, don't be so, don't be so resentful or frustrated at people who are late to the party and who are just having their eyes opened. Be grateful that their eyes are being opened and, and be that person who can help be a friend for them when they don't have anyone. And, you know, the, the, the silver lining of repressive regimes is I think, I think things become more obvious. Mm -hmm. Dystopia becomes more obvious Mm -hmm. and, um, I don't know. I have hope. I may not be articulating it well, but I have, I have faith in people. Maybe not all people. I have faith in 25% of people. Mm. <laughs> so, well, they say all you need is like 10% to, you know, basically move a mountain here. So 25 is pretty yeah, good. Uh, um, 25 is pretty good. Yeah. I, that, that. That's in the, that's from, that's kind of a joke. Cause I was reading recently about the Ash conformity experiments. Have you read about those? No. So in the 1950s, they did these series of experiments and they've done them several times since. And they basically were trying to figure out, they were trying to study conformity, the mm-hmm. nature of conformity in, in humans. And they did these really simple studies where they showed people, they would bring in a group of people, like maybe six people at a time. And they would show them a piece of paper with lines on it. And they would say, pick out the longest line. And it was always very obvious which line was longest, yeah. but five of the people would be plants and they would pick the shortest line. Yeah. Yeah. And then it would come to the sixth person who's actually the person being studied. And 75% of the time, they would pick the shortest. They would go with whatever the group picked. 
Wow. They would deny their own eyes. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? And it's said only, only 25% of people never conform. And at the first time I was reading about this, I was thinking, mm-hmm. that's such a small percentage of people. I can't believe it. But now I'm starting to think, that's actually pretty high. I hope yeah. we have 25%. Yeah. <laughs> if we have 25% of the population on our side, then that's a huge white pill. Yeah. But that's, and, and, and that's what shows like yours are helping push towards. So it's time for you to plug away at any, anything where they can follow you online oh. or your podcast or anything. Yeah. So you guys can visit, if you're interested, you can visit unsafespace.com. Like I said, we have a book club. You can join book club. It's free to join. If you want a, a reason, you want some pressure to get yourself to read more, uh, you can join our book club and you can find us on all the major platforms, except for Twitter, because we've been banned, but you can find us on YouTube still, uh, unsafe space and um, anywhere that you listen to podcasts. So thank you so much, Buck, yeah. for having me on. Thank you, Carrie, so much. I'm going to, as always, link to all of that in the show notes page, all of those links And uh, yeah, Carrie Smith, thank you for being here on Counterflow. Nice to meet you. I told you that was going to be a good chat. I know you enjoyed that. What a cool gal Carrie Smith is. And I'm thankful that she was here and able to do that. I hope this is the kind of episode that you can share with someone who you think might be ready to get the hell out of that evil cult of social justice warriors. And man, it's going to be it's going to be crazy over the next few years. We, we ought to take some bets here at Counterflow. You guys can join my Telegram group. Get that app, Telegram, and enjoy Counterflow with Buck Johnson. Should we be taking bets on how long it is until Kamala Harris takes over? And uh, I wonder if the SJW stuff will get worse because Biden's kind of, that's not his thing, let's face it, but maybe he's so old and decrepit that they're just going to shove it on him anyway. We shall see. My bet just for you guys, we can counter <laughs> these bets, so to speak, if you want. My bet is by September of 2021. And and I, I so for those of you who know me, you'll, you already know this, but I look at a lot of things timeline-wise in terms of football season. So I say by week one of the NFL season, Kamala Harris is president. That's my, that's my bet. You guys want to bet me on that one? Join the Telegram group and we can chat about it. And if you, uh, a lot of people ask me, what websites do you read? Well, one of them that I always read, and it's updated fairly often, it's got wonderful articles, is thehoppian.org for you guys who are fans of Hans Hermann Hoppe and his writings. Well, a lot of these authors on that site kind of take that philosophy and write about it and write in terms of current events and, and all of these kind of things. Thehoppian.org, check those guys out. Great people over there. And let's see, you can reach me. Well, right now, I keep saying this, I promise you we are going to get the Counterflow website going, but until then, you can still find me at deathtotyrantspodcast.com. You can find me on Twitter at Buck Rebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. And until next week, share this episode. You guys have a great week. See ya. You get split in fucking half, cause I call him the hologram brass, but I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast, rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid and gas. We smash a sinus with the power of Lord Titus, but I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast, our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. I want to tell you guys about a sponsor of this show, and that is a small business out of San Antonio, Texas called Paloma Verde. You can find them at palomaverdestore.com. With me here today to tell you about what they do, what they have, what they can offer you guys, it's Carlos and Vanessa Avalar. Go ahead and talk to my listeners about what y'all do, what you sell, and why they need to buy it. Hi, everybody. So um, basically what we sell is our premium grade uh, CBD, uh, broad spectrum CBD line. We have several products um, that can help with a variety of things that you might be suffering from or um, just need a little extra everyday support. Um, So we have our curcumin soft gels. 
Those are a mixture of uh, curcumin mixed with CBD. It's a perfect blend for anybody that has any kind of inflammation issues. If you're suffering, I mean, it's a wide range of things from arthritis. I mean, uh, some people need it for, I mean, so many things, Crohn's disease. I mean, it's fibromyalgia. I mean, it goes, it's, it's just like a very wide spectrum of things. And then we have our melatonin soft gels. Those will help you with your sleep. Our everyday soft gels, we have them in 10 and 25 milligrams. Those are perfect, like I said, for your everyday support. You just, you're feeling a little anxious. You know, you have a busy day coming up. Those are perfect to take at the beginning of your day. And then again, you know, in the middle or something, they last about six to eight hours of soft gel. Have our edibles, which is our gummies. We have strawberry lemonade and green apple. They're both delicious <laughs> and they last about the same time frame as the soft gels. And then we have our sports cream. That's great for anybody that needs that extra support when they're getting ready to go work out or when they come back. Great, a great aid for them. Same thing with our salves. Um, we have a few, a few different kinds, but those will help you with just your muscle and joint pain. And they are just amazing. And they smell all, you know, well, only two of them smell good, but one of them is unscented, but they're all, they work just as great, all three of them. And then I think that's pretty much it we have. But I mean, like I said, a variety of things. And um, yeah, so just if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out and be happy to give them a little bit more information on them. For my listeners that are wondering, well, does this work? I hear about this kind of stuff all the time. I don't know if I should try it. I don't want to jump into this world. You have a personal story on exactly why it works or how it works because uh, your father needed it. And that's how this kind of came about. Talk about that. He did. Um, we like to say that Paloma Verde is a labor of love for us. My dad was suffering from some um, chronic arthritis issues in his hands and in his feet. And then, um, you know, so we started to try and look for different things that could help them because doctors just wanted to keep giving them medication and medication. And so um, we tried to see what was the most natural route for them. And that's when we came across CBD and and uh, we started to test out new products. We gave it to my father and then um, Carlos's dad as well, because he at the same time was suffering from another um, chronic issue. So we had them sample it and um, we gave it us also to other friends and family, just people that we know would give us good feedback, you know, tell us the truth. Honest mm -hmm. feedback. Honest feedback. And so, you know, within a few days, you know, we would ask them, you know, daily, you know, how's it feel? How are you, how are you feeling? How are you doing? And, you know, they were just been good. My dad couldn't make a fist. Um, it was really hard for him when he started using the curcumin soft gels. I mean, he was like, I can, you know, close my hands. And I was just like, oh, that's wonderful. So, and that was kind of what kicked it off our, our dads. And, and so here we are. <laughs> Excellent. So Carlos... You are so cool to sponsor shows like mine. What will my listeners get when they enter code B-U-C-K at checkout? Yeah, so what they'll get is uh, right off the bat, 25% off any uh, product, anything they get off our uh, website, palomaverdestore.com. Plus, if they're a first-time uh, purchaser, they get an extra 10% off if they sign up for our uh, email list. And then... Um, that comes with free shipping. Yeah, 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 for free shipping, uh, over $75 is the to, to use the promo code. It's on, on anything on the on the website. So your listeners on their first purchase can get 35% off, which is not very common in the in the industry. You might get your 10s, your 15s, maybe your 20s, but 25% off and uh, extra 10, it's good savings. So, you know, we say this like we fix up the packages. Vanessa's hands are on them. She fixes up these packages. You're not going to get fancy shipping and stuff like that. We're giving the savings because we want to give the product out. We want to get the product into people's hands so they can try it out and uh, see kind of uh, uh, if they can get some benefits from it. Excellent. And that is at PalomaVerdeStore.com. Promo code BUCK, B-U-C-K. Carlos and Vanessa Abelard, thank you guys so much for being sponsors of this show. Thank you. Thank bye. you. This has been the Counterflow Podcast, a part of the Renegade Media Network.